Now, when I was in so like, yeah, Okay, fellow, I think. Regardless. Yeah, no. uh, yeah uh, I'm still no fan of Dalitism, still, uh, as, a, as an intellectual yeah. exercise. It's frustrating, uh, because 
Uh, I tried to change my hand. Yeah, and if someone does the speaker has, if you follow me. Motor skills and mid representation are very strange. I hope you remember the speed part. Fine art and university. Which is kind of a weird education cycle, but interesting. Yeah. I'm not taking yes. <laughs> I think it. Yeah. And and so the review where the panels are coming out. It's actually a You to submit an essay to the end of the month, and that's what I'm doing. Yeah. The final video. Okay. Actually, three hours after You know the notion of sort of. You can do all of this lovely thing about splitting you know, quite a bit of uh, so, uh, you can you say you can do all of that yeah. if you're now the one is I took this and I got to And the other is these two things come from the idea of the not to be said. And no, I don't think I've seen that. Oh, that's that. Yeah. Was Jesus over? Last my grandmother. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. I'll do a second. I'll go and view. Hi, welcome everyone, and welcome people online. I'm just not quite sure if you can hear me. Could uh, people online just type in the chat whether you can hear me and see me okay? I think I'll leave me open. Yeah, okay, very well. Um, I think you need to move to chat when you're there. Yeah, I just don't know how. That's... Oh, there. Oh. But now the, the other direction. Ah, okay. No, Thanks. No. <laughs> I'll just put it away. So, welcome, everyone. I'm really glad you made it. Welcome to you guys at home as well. You can't see me very well, but you know. Um, I'm very honored to welcome you all here today. And um, this is very special day for me because today we are um, announcing our project to foster analytic continental um, encounters and I was inspired to or oh, I was collaborating with Matthias on this and so um, he came here in September and he emailed me because we work in similar authors and he asked me why do people in St. Andrews and in Dundee not work together? We are so close by, we have such different interests. Why is it that we're not helping each other learn from each other? And I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And we got Walter, who's in the back there, on board, who is in St. Andrews. And we had another colleague, Judith Wall. She's in theology. But they have a similar problem. You have analytic theologians and you have continental theologians. And it's hard to get them to speak. So we are trying, to, or we are launching this um, network to get people to talk to each other. And it's very much more about work in progress, about learning, about growing, and about presenting something that's already fully developed. So it's going to be postgrads and lecturers just speaking on the things that they're interested in and learning from people with different backgrounds. Matthias will uh, bring um, emails. So if you wish to be on our mailing list, if you're interested in what we're doing, just let him know. And we'll get started sometime in the next semester just with some 
numbers of things that are interesting, and if interest is big enough, they're willing to stream it or make it local. So it's very much an open enterprise, and everybody is welcome to come. For me, the thing that always strikes me is that the thinkers I'm most interested in don't fit neatly in either category. So I work with Alfred North who, as you all know, wrote the Principia Mathematica with Russell, staunchly analytic project, but then he developed process ontology. Thinking with Husserl and with Husserl, wrote the logic, it was Frege who gave him the impetus to develop the kind of phenomenology that now characterizes continental philosophy. With me, that distinction makes no sense. And I'm really glad to see that there is more people who think that distinction just makes no sense. And it was very fortuitous and our plan that when Priest, a similar thinker who doesn't really care about these distinctions, this was going to be here in Dundee anyway. So we said, Oh, thank you, Frank. <laughs> so we said, let's make a virtue out of this and launch this conversation, launch this project with his thoughts. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for coming. And um, when you read his biography, I'm sure I don't need to say much, but when you read his biography, it's intense it. <laughs> 200 papers, six books, and a, a couple of unnumbered um, collected editions. And hugely an immense amount of books. Um, but what I find even more interesting is that he just goes where his interest takes him. On logic, he worked in non classical logic, he's mostly known for empiricism. He also works in Buddhist philosophy, history philosophy, Eastern philosophy. And today he will bring together many of those different interests and just bridge all those gaps that I think should be there. And I'm, I'm very glad to see it with us. And Newman's work he reaches out into Marxist theory and politics, on which he will be speaking tomorrow. So you all welcome to join us tomorrow for the Scottish Philosophical Association's annual meeting and um, if somebody doesn't know about it or wants more information let me know but that will be happening tomorrow also will also be speaking tomorrow again this wasn't planned it just happened <laughs> and our own Amelie will be speaking and um, so feel very welcome to join us tomorrow as well and um, now it just remains to me to hand you the word and Grand Priest will be speaking to us about nothingness and the limits of thought language thank you Hi, um, thank you very much, Tina, for the kind introduction. Um, it's really nice to be back in Scotland, where I've spent many years on and off. Um, I don't like the weather, but the people and the universities are always great, so it's fantastic to be back. Um, and uh, thank you to those people who've invited me. Um, there are a number of people involved in these things, and um, I'm very happy to be part of the Continental analytic was it encounter? Okay. Um, because uh, I suppose you know I started off life as a logician, but I guess that's analytic. I'm not quite sure what the labels mean anymore. But you know, I, I, over the years I've gone lots of different places. Tina said, and so I'm happy to be engaged in this project of bringing various different traditions together. Okay, can you guys out there in Zoom land hear me? It could be louder. Right. <clears throat> well, I have a horrible habit of wandering. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Very pathetic. So, is this any better out there in Zoom land? Yeah, yes. Unanimous. Okay. All right, so let me tell you what I want to talk about. Um, oh, doesn't move. Maybe you have to click on the. Yeah, okay. So um, this is our case at the limits of thought, sorry, the limits of the cosmos. Uh, are they the same? Well, we'll be talking about that. So um, this is, oh, okay. 
I want to talk about the question of whether there are limits to thought. Um, now, of course, you could mean many things by that question. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, um, I'll understand thought. Thinking of something is describing it, characterizing it, saying stuff about it. Um, so I want to ask the question of whether there are things that you can't describe, characterize, speak about. That's what I mean by the limits of thought. Um, so are there things that we have never thought about? Well, I guess, yeah. I mean, it's hard to say what they are because as soon as you say what they are, you've thought about them, right? But if you put yourself in the position of a medieval monk, then a medieval monk couldn't talk about the internet, COVID, black holes. They just didn't have the concept of apparatus. Um, we can now, of course, we have the concept of apparatus, but it would be hubris to suppose that we are not in the same situation vis-a-vis -vis that you know, issue that they were then. So there are things that we can't yet talk about. And maybe one day we will. It depends how long the human race lasts. You wouldn't want to put too much, uh, too big a bet on it at the moment, but never mind. Um, so are, are there things that we will never talk about, assuming the human race lives long enough? Well, um, probably. I mean, the world is probably infinitely complex. Certainly the world of mathematics is infinitely complex. So there are probably lots of things we'll never get around to talking about. But are there things that we cannot talk about, things which transcend the limits of language in principle? That's what I want to address. And I want to tell you that the answer is yes. And I want to give you an example of such a thing, and it's nothingness. Um, and if you're asking me how it is that I talk about something that you cannot talk about, and you suspect paradox, you're not a million miles away from the truth. Um, so I want to talk about nothingness uh, and its relationship to reality. What I mean, you'll see when we get there. Okay, so this is where we're going. First of all, I want to do a little bit of history to persuade you that I'm not entirely, entirely mad. Okay, so uh, I'll give you a bit of history about people who've transcended the limits of thought. I already thought there were things on the other side of thought. Then I want to talk about nothing, which is my real topic. And um, we'll talk about going beyond these limits. Um, and then I'll talk about nothing. This is the ground of reality and language. Um, that sounds kind of pretentious, doesn't it? Well, we'll see when we get there. Okay, so let's start off with the history. So, um, yeah, can you just click this slide, Tina, please? Okay. Yes, some history. Um, so, uh, oh, this is not working very well. Okay. Uh, it's going to be difficult if I haven't got it under control, my own control. Um, I don't know. Why has it stopped working? Maybe I have to point it or something. Yeah, that's ah, what I'm thinking. Yeah, okay. And then come the talk subject. Something is working. Right, do you know where the sensor is for this? Not really. It might be the battery. I have no idea. I think it's this box with the two slots. I'm pretty sure that's where it comes out. Otherwise, you can just use this, just like download over there. Um, is there a USB port on the system? Yeah. Sorry. So take my remote. Okay. okay, play amongst yourselves for a few minutes. <laughs> There's a piano. <laughs> yeah, is there any pianist in the audience? You have to quit the tune. Adam, how's your chance? <laughs> we can do it. Anybody's read it? 
Good to see you. The last time I came to the was, I think I gave a talk about five or six years ago, but the last time for that was. I would never have so. <laughs> okay, so normal service has now been resumed. So I'm going to start by giving you a bit of history uh, of people who are, think that there are things that cannot, in principle, be talked about. And as you'll see, this is a rich artery, maybe a um, a very rich artery that runs through the history of philosophy, both East and West. So here are some guys. Uh, uh -huh. There must be the proximity. Yeah. The piano's fault. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, so I should stand this side so I'm closer to the receptor. Okay. So this is Lao Tzu, who probably didn't exist, who uh, didn't write a book called the Tao Te Ching, because lots of people wrote it, probably. Um, but the famous first verse of the Tao Te Ching says uh, there is a principle behind phenomenal reality about which you cannot talk, and it's Tao. So there are things you can't talk of. Uh, the Tao Te Ching doesn't give uh, arguments that you can't talk about it, but various subsequent commentators on the Tao Te Ching did. So this is... Wang Bi, a little bit later, uh, who gave arguments that you can't talk about Tao. He gave a couple, in fact, but um, one of them is that if, if the Tao is behind all things, it cannot itself be a thing, otherwise it couldn't be behind all things. And you see this argument running through the history of uh, quite a lot of philosophy, East and West. So this is one example, Tao. Um, about the same time as Wang Bi, uh, you get Nagarjuna in India. Um, who is the first Mahayana Buddhist theorist. By, this, by the time of Nagarjuna, Buddhism is about 700 years old, six, 700 years old. So it's quite late in the history of Buddhism. But around the turn of the common era, you get the rise of a new form of Buddhism, Mahayana. And he is the first Mahayana philosopher. So in um, all forms of Buddhism, there are two suchas, two realities, two truths. One is uh, conventional reality, which is the kind of phenomenal reality that we all know and love or hate if you're a Buddhist. Um, and then there's the ultimate reality, which sort of stands behind it in some sense. Uh, what that is, different schools of Buddhism disagree about. But at least in Mahayana Buddhism, um, language applies only to conventional reality. It's partially constitutive of conventional reality. A fortiori, anything you talk about is conventional reality, you cannot talk about ultimate reality. It's ineffable. And this is a stream that runs through subsequent Buddhism. So there's, again, ultimate reality is something you can't talk about. Uh, okay, um, this guy, uh, Plotinus, um, sort of one of the originators of Neoplatonism, talks a lot about the one. So one is a kind of an ultimate principle, again, behind reality, rather like um, Taoism. Uh, and he says that it's ineffable, and he gives an argument rather like the argument that Wang Bi gave, because if it's behind, if it's the ground of all things, it cannot itself be a thing. Uh, all right, so the one is ineffable. Uh, okay, this guy, moving forward a little bit. Um, 
uh, the critic of pure reason, um, there's a distinction between phenomena and nomina. So phenomena are the things in space and time. Uh, and uh, what's distinctive of Kant's transcendental idealism is that uh, the things in space and time are partly constituted by our categories of space and time and the categories themselves, which are partly constitutive of phenomena. But of course, they've got to come from somewhere. So there are these things, lumina, beyond uh, space and time, such that the phenomena is constituted by the application of our categories and our concepts of space and time too. So you cannot talk about noumena because uh, noumena apply, sorry, you cannot talk about noumena because our categories apply only to phenomena. Phenomena in space and time and the categories, the criteria for the, the application of categories are temporal. So you can't really talk about noumena. Okay, let's move forward a little bit. Uh, Ludwig, okay, the Ludwig of the Tractatus. So as you probably know, you know, in the Tractatus, you get this story about the relationship between language and reality. Uh, language is composed of uh, propositions, which are names and formed in a certain way. They have a certain proposition, have a certain form. And reality is comprised by states of affairs, which are objects which are informed in a certain way. And the proposition defines a state of affairs if the names refer to the objects and the two things have the same form. So this is form in the Tractatus. And form is not an object um, for various reasons in the Tractatus, uh, which we didn't go into. But since form is not an object, you can't talk about it because propositions are about uh, objects, okay? So Wittgenstein says you cannot talk about form uh, last example, uh, this guy, Heidegger, uh, 1927, writes his first major article, Sein der Zeit, and asks the Seinsfrage, what is being? What is it to be? Um, and um, that's something that drives his thinking for the next, oh, 70 years, 60 years, 50 years. When did he die? 67? Yeah, okay, so 40 years. I think bad enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the beginning of Zion is like, he, he asks the Zion's frog, and he says immediately that there's one mistake you must not make. Um, you mustn't mistake it for a being. Being is the ground of beings. It's not itself a being. But if it's not a being, you can't talk about it because to say anything of anything is to treat it as a being. If I say you're in Dundee, I'm treating you as a being, okay? If I say uh, 36 is a prime number, I'm treating 36 as a being. So you cannot talk about being. All right, so this is a whistle-stop tour through the history of philosophy, and you'll see there are lots of people who have held that there are things which transcend thought. <laughs> in the sense that I mean, that you cannot talk about. Okay, now, I'm not gonna tell you that any of these guys was right. Actually, I don't think they were, but um, we'll come back to them in due course because I want to draw a contrast. Um, but for the moment, I just want to, you to note that, I'm, that there are plenty of great philosophers who have, of course, subscribed to the views I'm talking about and have thought that there are things which transcend thought. Okay, now, Let's talk about nothing. So the first thing to note about the word nothing is that it's ambiguous, okay? So uh, the word nothing can be a quantifier. Quantifiers are not names or nouns. They tell you that some things, all things, no things, many things, most things satisfy some condition or other, okay? Um, so, for example, if I ask someone a question and they don't reply, I might say, she said nothing. That nothing is a quantifier, okay? And it just means, uh, as logicians put it, for no X did she say X, okay? So, of course, nothing, the word nothing can be a quantifier. That's not used. But 
it can also be a noun phrase. So uh, when it's used as a noun phrase in English, close synonym is nothingness. Okay, so nothing in English can be used as a noun phrase meaning nothingness. So, um, so as I said, Heidegger wrote some very interesting things about nothing. What I probably don't mean is for no X, did Heidegger write some very interesting things about X? Although some people <laughs> in the audience might think so. Right? But what I'm more likely to mean is that Heidegger wrote some very interesting things about nothingness. Okay, that's using it as a noun phrase. Or suppose I say Hegel and Heidegger wrote about nothing and said different things about it. The it is an anaphoric pronoun which refers back to the object picked out by the noun phrase nothing. Okay, so um, I want to talk about nothing and use it as a noun phrase. Now, um, that's kind of hard because in natural language, uh, the word slides around a lot and I'm afraid there's much confusion in the history of philosophy about trading on this ambiguity. Um, of course, it can be a source of puns as well. So uh, Lewis Carroll, um, when Alice meets the White King, he asks her if she can see anyone coming down the road and she says, I can see no one, or it's no one rather than nothing, but the point's the same. So she says, I can see no one. And the king says, my God, what good eyesight you've got. It's much like new to see real people. Okay, this is a sort of Caroline joke, but um, it trades on the ambiguity. And if you're not very careful about the distinction between the noun phrase and the quantifier, you're gonna get very confused. So I'm, when I use in writing or in the slides, nothing as a noun phrase, I'll bold face it like that. It's, it's kind of hard to do this in a written talk. I could say, nothing, <laughs> um, but I'll forget. So what I'll try to remember to do is use the word nothing as a noun phrase. And when I want to use the quantifier, I would say no thing. Okay. All right, so uh, nothing is a thing. Why? Well, you can think you are now and you're thinking about something. Uh, so when you're thinking of nothing, your thought is not contentless. Nothing is the thing you're thinking about, it's the content of your thought. Now, I, I realize that this is initiating a whole discussion into intentionality here. And we can, I'm not gonna talk about this more now, we can talk about it in the discussion if you want to, but I'm just registering this fact that nothing refers to something. Ah, okay, but nothing is, well, you can characterize it in a bunch of different ways, but you know, a, a nice entry point is that nothing is what remains after everything has been removed. Nothing is what's left if you take away everything, okay? As such, nothing is no thing because everything has been removed. So nothing is nothing. Well, ergo, you can't predicate anything of nothing. There's literally no thing there to predicate anything of. Okay, so uh, nothing turns out to be one of these things beyond the limits of thought. Okay. And that's something I will, I'm not gonna offend all the other guys I talked about, this I'm prepared to defend. Okay, so nothing is one of these ineffable things beyond the limits of thought. All right, so uh, in fact, I mean, uh, this thought is not novel. Uh, this is a quote from Heidegger, across his metaphysic. He says, what is nothing? And very first approach the question has something unusual about it. In our asking, we posit nothing in advance as something that is such and such. We posit it as a being, but that's exactly what it's distinguished from. Interrogating nothing, asking what and how it, the nothing, it, nothing is, 
turns what is interrogated into its opposite. The question deprives itself of its own object. Okay, so the jargon is Heideggerian, but he's pointing out that uh, you, you can't speak about nothing because literally there's no thing there to talk about. Okay, so um, what I've tried to argue so far is that there are plenty of good philosophers who think that there are things beyond the limits of thought. And I too think that there are things beyond the limit of thought and nothing is such a thing. All right, so that's what's on the other side of the limit. Now, um, some things then are ineffable or at least held to be ineffable by some philosophers, um, but don't the people who think this say a lot about them? And the answer of course is yes. Um, so indeed the people who think that there are things beyond the effable give reasons as to why this is the case. Wang Bi does, Plotinus does, Wittgenstein does, Heidegger does, Kant does, and I did, as far as nothing goes just now. And obviously, if you give arguments about why these things are beyond the ethical, you've got to talk about them, right? So um, it seems that if you think that there are things beyond the ethical and you give reasons as to why they're beyond the ethical, they've got to be ethical too. So um, you're in a contradiction, right? What can you do about this? Well, there are many different responses. First of all, you might reject the theory which says that there are things beyond the ethical as crazy or at least false. Okay, that's a possible reaction. Um, not everyone accepts uh, Heidegger's views about being, not everyone accepts a tractatus or, or can it's transcendental idealism. Um, although, of course, lots of smart philosophers have, but that's one possible reaction. Um, you might not have any reaction at all. You might think that's fine. Um, so if you read the Taoist uh, commentators, if you read the early Mahayana commentators, uh, and if you read many of the uh, Neoplatonists, they don't jack up at all about the fact that they seem to be embroiled in a contradiction. Um, maybe they had reservations. Who knows? These guys were writing a long time ago. Um, you could draw a distinction. That's how Kant tries to get out of the problem. Uh, in the critique, he distinguishes between a positive use of noumenon and the negative use and says, well, you know, negative use is there just to remind you of things you can't talk about. Uh, that's okay. Um, but the positive use, when you try and say things about them, you can't do that. Um, pardon? Okay. Uh, this is going to get me in trouble with Kant scholars, but we can talk about that later too. Okay, um, you can hold your work to be meaningless. No prizes for guessing who did that, okay? Uh, or um, you can struggle, as Heidegger did in his later writings, okay? He essays lots of ways of trying to, you know, approach this problem he's posed for himself. Um, and uh, I'm not gonna talk about the things he essayed, um, but he struggled. Um, but I think that if you are in this situation, the honest answer is just to be a dilutheist. Okay? There are things which are ineffable, but you can speak about them so they are effable as well. Yes, that's a contradiction. Okay? Um, so, I'm, I'm certainly a dilutist about nothing. Okay. Um, now, I'm not the first person to talk about crossing the boundaries of thought. Here is Hegel from the logic. Um, great stress is laid upon the limitations of thought, of reason, and so on, and it's asserted that limitation cannot be transcended. Yet to make such an assertion is to be unaware that the very fact that something is determined as a limitation implies that the limitation is already transcended. 
So he's well aware of this phenomenon. Um, so um, if, you, if you think about it, if there are boundaries between what can be spoken about and what cannot be spoken about, um, then uh, you have this boundary. Boundaries, almost by definition, are paradoxical or contradictory entries, entities, because a boundary both separates and joins the two sides. And the boundary at the limits of thought is really just a special case of this, because on the boundary, you've got the kind of the things that can't be spoken about, the things that can be spoken about, and then the things on the boundary, which make the distinction, which both can and cannot be spoken about. Okay, so um, what I've told you so far then is that uh, a lot of smart people have thought there are things that are ineffable, they've managed to speak about them, and even I think that there's at least something that's ineffable and you can speak about, uh, nothing. Okay, so what I want to do now is think some more about nothing. So, prima facie, nothing, as an example of the ineffable, would seem to be rather different from the other things that some people have thought transcend the boundaries of thought. Because um, in the historical cases I gave you, um, the contradictory things in question are in some sense beneath the object of the world, or at least by a grasp of them. In some sense, they ground a reality. So let's just sort of run through that list of people again and, and you know, note this fact. So um, for Taoism, the phenomenal world is a manifestation of Tao. Okay, so Tao is beneath our phenomenal reality. For Mahayana Buddhism, uh, conventional reality is delivered by placing our conceptual grid on ultimate reality. So in some sense, it grounds conventional reality. Um, Neoplatonism, uh, our phenomenal world is generated by the one, okay? A bit like Tao. Uh, Kant, phenomena are obtained by the imposition of our categories and spatio-temporal temporal concepts on what uh, is given to us by noumena. So again, the phenomena are kind of behind our phenomenal world and uh, constructed by our categories and spatio-temporal concepts. Um, Wittgenstein, um, form, this ineffable thing, makes possible the existence of states or affairs and propositions too for that matter, but reality is composed of states or affairs and uh, form makes the existence of states or affairs possible. No form, no, no states or affairs. Um, and uh, Heidegger being, as he says in Zeit, Zeit is what makes beings be. It's the ground of beingness, so to speak. All right. So in all these guys, you will notice that the ineffable thing is um, behind our reality, our conventional reality, or at least our grasp of it. Um, and the reality, at least our phenomenal reality, depends upon, is grounded out in these ineffable objects. Okay, so um, what about nothing? Nothing doesn't seem to be similar. There's no immediately obvious reason why nothing should be this kind of thing too. It seems uh, totalmente different from anything in our phenomenal reality. Okay. I want to persuade you that's not the case, that nothing is also something uh, behind our world, or at least our grasp of it, or both as well. So, um, to persuade you of this, what we're talking about is the dependence of our phenomenal world on something or other. 
So I need to talk a bit about um, ontological dependence, which, as you may know, has come from enormous hammering in the metaphysical literature in the last 20 years or so. Um, exactly what it is or how many kinds of ontological dependence there are, you know, the literature goes over the, all over the place. I'm not going to go into sort of big details now, but let's just get you know, a few thoughts about ontological dependence straight. That'll be useful. So um, suppose that S is the shadow of a tree. Then uh, S depends for being what it is, the shadow of a tree, on T, the tree. How do you know? Well, there's an appropriate counterfactual. Had T not been a tree, S would not have been the shadow of a tree. Fair enough. So S depends for being what it is on T. Not the other way around, though. Tree doesn't depend on having a shadow. All right. So this is just a, a standard example of ontological dependence. Let's have another one. Um, suppose that M is a molecule of water. Then this depends on its containing an atom of oxygen, A. Had A been an atom of something else, such as nitrogen, M would not have been a molecule of water. Okay, so M depends for being what it is on A. Okay, is another standard example. Now, what I want to show you is that dependence can be negative as well as positive. Okay, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, suppose you have a person, P, who has a spouse, S. Then S being a spouse, P, depends on being a different person from P. You can't marry yourself. At least not yet. Okay. So had S been P, S could not have been the spouse of P. Same kind of counterfactual. So S depends on being what they are, uh, on being different from P, okay? So the, the dependence is negative. Here's another example. Suppose you've got a hill. Uh, H can be a hill only because it's distinct from the surrounding plane. It's got to rise above the plane, otherwise it wouldn't be a hill. So had H been the same height as P, it wouldn't have been a hill. There's the negative dependence. So H depends on being what it is, a hill, on being different from P. Okay. So what you've seen is that ontological dependence, as expressed by counterfactual, can be both positive and negative. Now let's come to nothing. Okay, I want to show you that what it is to be an object is to be dependent on nothing. So here's the argument. Suppose that something X is an object, a thing, a being. Then if X had been the same as nothing, it would have been no thing, because nothing is no thing. So if X had been identical with nothing, uh, it would have been no thing. So X depends on being what it is, an object on being distinct from nothing. So objects depend ontologically on being different from nothing. This is another example of negative dependence. So what I've just given you an argument for is the claim that um, being an object depends on nothing. Okay. You can depict this uh, quite nicely like this. So um, think of the plane for a start and the hills. Okay, so here's the ground, uh, the plane, and here are the objects, which are hills, uh, and they're hills because they stand out from the ground. But you can think of this picture another way. The ground can be nothing, okay? And the objects are things that stand out about, above, so things that stand out from the ground. Um, again, this is not a radically new thought because um, here's Heidegger for you. Nothing is neither an object nor any being at all. Nothing comes forward neither for itself nor next to beings to which it would, as it were, adhere. For human existence, nothing makes possible the openness of beings as such. Nothing does not merely serve as the counter concept of beings. Rather, it originally belongs to their essential unfolding as such. Okay, so the jargon's Heideggerian, but he's making the point that I just made. 
nothing is the ground of beings. Beings are beings because they stand out against nothing. Okay, okay. and that's why I've given you an argument for. So um, what I've tried to show you uh, is that nothing does lie beneath the objects of our world in exactly the same way that, um, or in a similar way, the other people we talked about in the history of philosophy thought that this ineffable, ob effable, ineffable object stands beneath our phenomenal reality. So uh, nothing is actually in the same class, I think. It is an object that stands beneath our reality, i.e. the objects which comprise it. Okay, so... <clears throat> Uh, okay. Um, nothing is beneath our reality. Now, I want to point out that it's also beneath our ability to speak. Um, because to say that X is such and such is to treat it as an object. This is a familiar Heideggerian point or Wittgensteinian point. Um, so, to say something about anything, you have to predicate something of it and therefore treat it as an object. So, that there are objects is a precondition of our ability to be able to talk and speak at all. So, nothing is not only the ground of our reality, but it's a precondition of our ability to talk at all. Okay, so that's the end. Uh, let me just tell you what I've said so that you can disagree with it. Okay, so first of all, what I've argued is that there is a boundary between the effable and the effable. Specifically, there are things on the other side of it. There are things which are ineffable. But I've been talking about some of those things, at least one of them, namely nothing. Uh, and as Wittgenstein says in the Tractatus, in order to draw a limit to thinking, we should have to be able to think both sides of the limit. We should therefore have to be able to think what cannot be thought. Absolutely right. We just have. Um, so, there are things which are both effable and ineffable. And um, I've given you one example of such a thing. That's the one I'm prepared to defend here and now. And that's nothing. Nothing is a very strange object. Um, it's an object that is paradoxically both something and nothing. It's dilithic. So at the ground of both reality and our ability of talk of it lies paradox. Thank you very much for this. Um, I wanted to say a talk about nothing, but it's a talk about a lot of things. <laughs> um, I'm just asking, um, do, do people want a two minute break? Um, or should we just go and have some stretches for a little bit? Quick break. Quick break, okay. Wait a couple of minutes and then we'll reconvene. Can <coughs> okay, you then talk about nothing, so it's a break. How's life in the department? Steve? How's life in the department? Yeah. <laughs> 
But you still can't get to work here, right? Yeah. That's right. That was my follow up. Yeah. <laughs> Well, okay, so for two years, uh, the, the graduate center was closed. So everything was online, and in the last year, we've, we've slowly opened up. Yeah. And I, I, I do go, but the graduate center is a very strange place. Not to be going in anyway. They can two take classes and put off. So I'm usually there, and I'm happy for all of um, I usually go in you know, three or four days a week. I go to teach uh, the colloquial department of meetings. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we've all realized how to be, yeah. 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 I think a lot of the people yeah. who yeah. after the pandemic decided they're not going to come in again. I know, I mean, so is the last but he would not come in the Yeah, yeah. 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 But I mean, you know, COVID changed a, a lot of things very suddenly. Um, and some of those things, I'm not going to go back to what they were before. <laughs> question from one of our viewers. Um, Catherine writes, uh, what a great talk. I'm a PhD student. Stop there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good question. It's a good question. That's why we're starting with it. I'm a PhD student writing on nothing and the void in Hegel's Science of Logic. Ooh. I'm wondering how you would differentiate nothing and the void. Is nothing, brackets, and or the void, and brackets, a logical determination or natural determination or both. In terms of nature, is natural nothing simply space? Oh gosh. <laughs> All right, An interesting question. I, I deliberately refrain from talking about Hegel because it's complicated and I'm not sure that I've got it all straight. Um, I, I actually think that Hegel's rather confused about nothing. Um, so if you look at um, the beginning of the logic, you know, the famous dialectic between being and nothing, um, the first category is being, the second category should be its negation, which is not being, okay? 
and not to be is not the same as nothingness. Um, so I actually think some of that discussion is rather confused, um, but it would take, I guess, a lot of time to go into that now. Um, but certainly Heidegger talks about nothingness in many other places as well. And I'm not suggesting that, that this confusion runs right the way through uh, Hegel. Um, you raise the question of the void. Um, the void makes many appearances in philosophy and, and in quantum mechanics. So there's a quantum void, there's Mu in Japanese philosophy. Um, these are not the same thing. And I'm not sure that any of these things is the same as what I've been talking about when I refer to nothing, which is the absence of all things. Uh, nothing in the sense that I've talked about is certainly not the quantum void. Um, it's probably not exactly the void that you get in, in Japanese philosophy either. Um, but I think what we need to do to pursue this question further is to sit down together and look at the places uh, in, in, Heide in Hegel, sorry, I keep confusing the two. Look at the places in Hegel where he talks about nothing and see what he actually says about it. Um, so um, maybe if you want, we can continue this discussion by email because it's going to require us to get our text out and hammer through some, some Hegel. Um, what's it? All right, no, it's a, yeah, great, 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 I'm not stopping yet, so. Uh, twice we made moves that made me pause, because you, you had M go, and one of the early slides, and then at the very end, uh, something about the planet. You can predicate something of the nothing. Therefore, the nothing is an object. And I thought that was strange because we can predicate things on property and the logical ah, is a property of the property. Yes, so good. The fact that we can predicate of being nothing doesn't it doesn't even follow that the nothing is an object, it could be a property. No point taken. Um look, okay. First of all, uh, there's a certain sense in which properties are objects. Redness is an object, okay? Um, if it's referred to by a noun phrase, then it's an object. Um, but sometimes, we, uh, following uh, Frego, you might talk about concepts. Okay, Frego has got his own problem with concepts, as you know, okay? Um, and if you really dig your heels in and distinguish between concepts and properties, which are in some sense, first order representation of, of concepts, then uh, you have to think that there are second order concepts, okay? If you think that, then I, I, I agree with you, okay? Um, you can talk, if you think that there are concepts distinct from objects, then you, you've got to have second order concepts as well. So probably I should be more careful about what I said and talk about um, things that you can talk about referred to by noun phrases. So th th thanks for pointing that out. I should be more careful about this. There is a, in, another twist in comment. Can yeah, I please. A quick follow up? Because again, you mentioned, you mentioned Brigham, and I didn't mind the concept of course. Yeah. Right? And, and Brigham says it, it's kind of deep at the bottom of language. But mm. if you read Heidegger, one thing that he does, it says, look, you cannot really use Proper name to talk about the nothing. We need to make the nothing into a verb. <laughs> right. And then we can capture the nothing. So we use a verb to capture something which is neither a property nor an object, it's something we need. Yeah. And we okay. need a verb where this name would fail us. So yeah. Okay, what good. What do you think about that? Yeah, look. Um, okay. So there's this thing which Karnak took exception to. That's nicht nicht it. Okay. Um, look, first of all, on questions of translation, um, das nicht is usually translated as the nothing. That's a terrible translation, right? Because German 
has a definite article for most abstract nouns, whereas English doesn't. It's more sensible to talk, just say nothing or nothingness, okay? Okay, but, um, so he says nothing, and then there's this thing which, you know, you, you, it's, it's not a real word in German, no, but so it's, it's hard to translate into a word in English, but people translate it as nuths, nothing nuths. So he, he does think nothing does something in nuts. Well, what exactly that is, we can you know, talk about. But notice, he hasn't got rid of using the word nothing as a noun phrase. Nuts, to nuth is what nothing does, okay? So it's not, a, not that he's turned the noun into a verb, but he has in one sense, but he hasn't got rid of the noun phrase in the process. He's just invented something for it to do, so to speak. Last point in a nutshell. Um, is, uh, uh, I, I think it's an objection to, to um, modern logic is that when you translate X is red as F bracket X, you do away with a copula. And then you really take away the verb. Well, then, so if you, if you go back to the translations, we've got this kind of rigid picture of the relation between language and reality, mm -hmm. where it's either names or predicates, but when it's a copula. Yeah. So you could think that nothing slips between the tracks. Yeah, look, um, as I said, in, in, in post-care, Heidegger struggles with how to deal with this problem. He's well aware of the problem, okay? And he essays many different things. Um, he essays the thought that you can write it under erasure. This is, didn't say that. Um, he sometimes says, well, you know, I've just said this, uh, redness, um, redness, no, being, being, no, I can't say anything ungrammatical, you know, but you know what I mean. I mean, it's not a million miles from Frager at this point, right? And of course, he says, taking a leaf out of the, the uh, Tractatus, you can't say what being is, but you can kind of show it in poetry. So, you know, all these things you find in the post care writings, something else you find in the post care writings, which I find interesting, is that in the Beiträger, his diaries from the 1930s, he's actually a dialetheist. He says, uh, not, uh, well, he's talking about being, and he thinks being is nothing, okay? I think he's wrong about that, but he makes that identification. Uh, but when he talks about being in the Beiträger, he, he says, look, being is not a being, and yet it is. Hey, you think I'm contradicting myself? Don't be so fucking clever. Of course, why should you think that the law of non-contradiction holds for being? Just characterizes beings. So, you know, uh, whether that was his final opinion, you know, to Heidegger scholars argue about, but dialectic is one of the things he he toys with at least at one stage of his career as well. So as I say, you know, he, he struggles with the problem, I think. Wonderful discussion, I want to leave later. <laughs> Hi, yeah, I wanted to ask you uh, to say why we should care about this dependency of all objects, including ourselves mm. on something. So the reason I ask mm. you this, when you're talking about normal ontological dependency, you have mm. this uh, thought, well, the mind is dependent on the brain and you mm. abolish brains then you don't get minds and but nothing precisely cannot be abolished because it's already not that. correct or is there a theology in which nothing oh. could be abolished by god i think i'll leave that to the theists in the audience <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's a fair enough question why why be interested in nothing i uh, look, to be quite honest, um, I engage with it because I find it fascinating. Uh, and uh, I think what I've said is true, you know, and fallibly, of course. Um, so, you know, why, why I'm interested is just that I, I find the subject fascinating. I mean, you know, I've always been interested in paradox and uh, paradox of many kinds run through the history of Western philosophy. I don't think the paradox of nothingness has been really appreciated. 
Um, so that's one reason why it interests me. Now, could the thing have profound consequences? Um, look, certainly some Christians have thought this, you know, especially the Christian mystics drawing on Plotinus, like Meister Eckert, Kazanus. Um, and there is always a temptation to reify nothing into something like God. And you find this in Nishida as well. Um, personally, I'm not tempted to go down that track because I'm not a theist. Um, okay, but uh, I can't think of anything else to say. <laughs> thank you. Hi, um, so thank you so much for your talk. It was uh, really intellectually stimulating, forced me to think about Nagarjuna in a slightly different way. Um, and I was just wondering if you could maybe um, expand a bit on like, the relationship might see nothingness or your conception of nothingness having with like Nagarjuna's Madhyamika's conception of Nirvana, where, you know, like in Westerhoff's discussion of Nagarjuna, he talks about how Nagarjuna doesn't see language um, as being inherently problematic, but just that like it's useful as a heuristic tool. But when you cross over into assuming language possesses the capability to be objectively referential to reality or even to itself, that's the problem that Nagarjuna's Buddhism has with it. And I was just, and Nagarjuna talks about how, you know, nirvana is attained, enlightenment is attained when you cease hypostatization, cease all conceptualization. So, in a sense, you might think that, you know, nirvana entails like not thinking anymore. But if you're a Buddhist, the Buddha attained enlightenment and he's not someone that's been lobotomized. So, clearly, something is still going on there. I was just wondering if you could maybe expand a bit on that. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Wow, what a question. Um, look, there's a lot to say about this. Let me try and keep it as short as I can. And I don't think I'll do justice to all your questions. Um, the Buddha Majavaka Karaka is a very difficult text. Um, it's elusive and elusive. And of course, subsequent scholars will argue about what the hell is going on there. Um, and you know, Mahayana develops for 2,000 years after the Mahayana Kari, and people make different things of it. Um, and I don't think there's a uniform answer to your question. It's going to be different, for example, in Tibetan Buddhisms and the Chinese Buddhisms like Zen. Well, let's just stick to Nagarjuna. Um, the distinction between conventional ultimate reality is pre, pre, predates, I mean, it, it runs through all Buddhism, even earlier Buddhism. Um, most Buddhists think that conventional reality is our Lebenswelt, okay? They disagree about what ultimate reality is. So what really marks out Nagarjuna is his attack on earlier Buddhist theory of ultimate reality. <coughs> and uh, you, you get this thesis that everything is empty, shunya, which doesn't mean non-existent, it means having no intrinsic existence. Um, and I guess if I'd been Nagarjuna, having done that, I'd have dispensed with the notion of ultimate reality, but he didn't. And you know that because he tells you so. He says, you know, there are two realities, and you need them both. Um, he doesn't come clean about what exactly ultimate reality is. That's left for later thinkers like Chandra Kinsey. Um, but what develops in the the Majyamika commentary is that um, whatever it is, our reality is ineffable because our concepts are partly constitutive of conventional reality. Um, so, you know, what I said was, was right about the tradition. Um, now, what makes it really hard is that a dozen verses, a dozen chapters later in the Majyamika Karaka, after Wittgenstein, sorry, God, it's one of those After Nagarjuna has said there are two realities, he says they're the same thing. Okay, so he says, and I quote more or less verbatim, there is not one iota of difference between samsara and nirvana. Okay, samsara is our conventional world, nirvana is, you know, what you get when you grasp the ultimate. So how do you understand this distinction? There are two realities, there's only one. Okay. 
that is a big debate in subsequent Buddhism and subsequent Buddhists go different ways, subsequent Mahayana Buddhists go different ways on this. Um, okay, so Chandra Kid goes one way, Tsongkhapa goes another, Dogen goes another. Uh, so I don't think there's a uniform story, but um, what they all agree on is that ultimate reality, whatever it is, is what happens when you uh, grasp the ultimate. Okay, so I, I've said you can't characterize, you can't describe it. That doesn't mean you can't experience it, okay? There's this sort of useful distinction that Russell draws between knowledge by description and knowledge by acquaintance. Uh, and all the Buddhists I'm aware of think you can have knowledge by acquaintance of the ultimate. You just can't describe it. You know, they're a bit like many of the Christian mystics in this regard. So sorry um, if I've wandered around your question. So you, nice to see you. Um, so you, you argued um, for admitting nothingness as an entity by saying that we can think about it and our thoughts are not yes. contentless. And yes, then yes. I think one slide later, you were arguing that we couldn't think about nothingness. Yes. But I know that's, a, you know, from a dialectic point of view, that's no big deal. Yes. But <laughs> <laughs> kind of, from a non dialectic point of view, it's, 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 you feel a bit as though you, be got away from from uh, your feet and okay. first argument. So I just wonder. I mean, are there other ways of arguing for admitting nothingness as an entity? I mean, you hinted at one maybe as taking away oh. a sort of meriological null object or something. You take away yeah. okay, good. something, and it's what you get at the end. But are there other ways of doing it? Yeah, there are. Look, um, so I, there have actually been a few books on nothingness in the last five or six years. I was curious to see. Um, and people have suggested that there are other things uh, that you might think of as nothingness. So as one Italian writer suggests it's the empty possible world. Um, and there are various other suggestions which are now slipping my memory, but there are other ways of doing it. My reaction to those is as follows. Um, Call that nothingness, if you like. After all, what's in the word? Um, but uh, but there, there does seem to be something you can characterize as what remains after everything is removed. Or, you know, what I've said elsewhere is it's the merry logical sum of things in the empty set. Now, there's, a, there's an issue to be discussed there about whether or not those descriptions succeed in referring. Okay, that's a fair point. But assuming they do for the moment, um, it's clear that that characterization of nothing is very different from the, uh, these kind of ersatz theories of nothingness. Okay, um, and all I would want to say is, you know, you can talk about these ersatz objects if you want to, but when I talk about nothing, that's what I'm talking about. That's your question. Thank you. This is going to be a very unarticulated question. But I want to I'll give you a very unarticulated answer. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I want to. Um, I want to um, ask about the relation between the notion of nothingness and otherness. Oh. And what is prompting uh. this question is that I got to start in your notion of. Um, negative dependence. Right. So presumably each of us negatively depends on being different from every one of us. Mm. Uh, sorry, everyone else. Right. And this um negative dependence can be characterized the notion of otherness. Right. So if the way in which you justify the um evaluation of nothingness is by means of this negative dependence. Can we think of the notion of nothingness as the absolute version of the notion of otherness? Yeah. Otherness is certainly a relative point. Yeah, that's not an inarticulate question at all. <laughs> that's a very good question. Um and it never even occurred to me. So uh what do I think? I think something like this. Um to, to, to be other is um, is a contrastive, 
Okay, you've got to be other than something. And of course, you can be other than uh, Tina, other than my bank account, other than Saturn. Um, so there's a very general notion of being other. Now, um, the negative characterization of ontological dependence I gave you did imply otherness in a certain way, namely, uh, you've got to be different from, okay? And uh, the particular argument um, for objects depending on nothing that I gave you is a special case of that. Um, namely, it's contrasting beings, objects, things, with nothing. So what it seems to me is that what I've said about nothing and beings is a, is a sort of special case of the otherness relation. Um, of course, you know, the, the, the notion of otherness gets put to many different uses in contemporary philosophy. Um, and that's, that's fine. Um, I mean, it, it, it does seem to me that this kind of the, the otherness involved of beings and nothing is kind of pretty fundamental, which brings us back to your question of, you know, what, why, why is that sort of that fundamentality so important or interesting? Um, but I mean, if I'm right, that this, this, this particular case of nothingness is um, beneath the very nature of reality and our grasp of it and our ability to describe it. That structure is pretty fundamental. Um, so, you know, I, can, I guess that's all I have to say in response to the question at the moment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I have a question also about negative ontological uh, dependence because when mm. you uh, briefly uh, uh, cited Hegel in the logic yeah. uh, and the point that, like the Grenze Schranke distinction, um, okay. that, that Kant is constantly trespassing into a territory where he should not be, where according to his own account, he cannot go, right? Um, there are symptoms of that for Hegel, right? And the symptoms are that they're not only positive judgments, which predicate something, yes. sort of predicate, or negative judgments, yes. which negate the predication, but also infinite judgments, yes. which, right, attribute a non-predicate. Yes. And thereby, Kant believes, assign existence, right? That is how he talks about the immortality of the soul. That's, that's the point, right? Um, we can't say anything about the soul, but it must be there <laughs> somehow, and it must be more, or otherwise it would have been a soul. Um, Hegel infers from that, if I understand correctly, and now I'm wondering if, you, if that would be in line with what you said um, and what you argued for. And from this, we can follow that we must think that what we cannot think as that which we cannot think. Because that means that thinking is grounded, and that would be the ontological dependence that he struggles with at the beginning of the logic already, with the beginning of thought, right? God's thought before the creation of the world. One must think that which one cannot think as that which one cannot think, because that is thinking. Yeah. Okay, that, that's interesting. Look, um, first of all, can a couple of, a couple of comments on Kant before we get to Hegel. Um, you're, you're right that Kant draws this distinction. Um, of course, it doesn't get him out of the problem, as many commentators have pointed out, because um, negation and um, infinite judgments are part of the categories. Um, so it's applying the categories to these things. So that's, that's the problem. Um, so uh, Kant does seem to be struck with this. Problem, stuck with this problem, and he's well aware of this. You know, the second edition of the critique is complete balls up because he makes it worse. Um, and Hegel notes this, of course. I mean, it's part of his attack on Kant in the logic. Um, Hegel's response, as far as I understand it, is simply to deny the distinction between phenomena and nomina. Okay, and he says things like, "Well, you know." Kant says you can't really know the noumena, but there's nothing that's easier to know because there's nothing there, you know, or nothing. Uh, it, it's what you get when you remove all characterizations. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure that his response is the same as the one you described. Now, uh, I'm not a Hegel scholar, 
Uh, and it may well be that in places, maybe even in the logic, he does give the characterization that you just suggested. And that would certainly be very interesting because it would bring it very close to what I've said here. Um, for reasons I briefly alluded to with the first question, I don't think you're going to find this in, in the first triple of uh, the dialectic in, in the logic. Um, but it wouldn't at all surprise me if you found it elsewhere. So uh, now if, if you can, if you've got some specific quotes from bits of Hegel where he says something like this, I'd be very interested to know. Thank you for the lovely talk. I'm a philosopher of mind, so this is a bit out of my area, but I'm going to ask a couple of questions anyways. Sure. Uh, so one of them is, uh, it sounded like there's a quick route from believing in ineffables to paradox. Yes. Uh, so does that generalize it? Is it the case, so far as you can tell, that if you want to believe in ineffable, you're very quickly going to land yourself in paradox? Yes. And so you might as well just be a dialethist. <coughs> Or, or give up on or your, wriggle out of it some other way. Or give up on your ineffable. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, you know, you, you can give up your theory and say it's a lot of crap. You can, you know, do what you can try and said and say, well, you know, the whole tractate is meaningless. <clears throat> but, I mean, if you're serious, then I think you should be a dialectist. So one, one thing I didn't talk about is the strategies that people have employed to get out of this bind. Um, that would take a whole nother talk. Um, your probably, argument was pretty nip tight. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, people have tried to get out of the bind in various ways. Um, I don't think they're successful, but we'd have to look at the ways that have been suggested to make good on that claim. Um, that's why I think if you really are in this situation, um, better than try to wriggle out of it in ways that don't work, you should be a dialetheist because you really are in a paradoxical situation. And I mean, I don't know how you know how much you know about the, the discussions of paradox and dialetheism in the last 30 or 40 years, but a lot of people, uh, including myself, have argued that paradoxes like the liar or um, the sororities actually land you in this kind of contradiction. Um, if if you see it from that perspective, the paradox of nothingness is just one thing that you can add to this list, which might go some way to assuaging one, one of your worries, Adam, because um, it is sort of part of a bigger picture of, hey, it's not just an ad hoc move. It, it actually fits in this category of dealing with paradox of, paradoxes which are otherwise intractable. <clears throat> My second question that's helpful was um, again about ineffability. <clears throat> If you see daylight between the concept of ineffability and something like uh, the concept of things that we can't understand, oh. so maybe we can't understand the final theory of physics, or oh. in philosophy of mind, we've got the Mysterian view, which says the solution to the mind body problem is beyond our understanding. Uh, so, is that something different from being ineffable? And on the other end, as a perceptual theorist, I often think, well, there's things that we can experience in perception that maybe aren't effable, mm. because effable seems to involve publicity mm. and mm. Uh, perception at its root, maybe has something more private than that. Yeah. Uh, so okay, uh, are you happy with that too? So there, there are two thoughts there. Um, prima facie, um, saying that it's ineffable uh, is very different from saying you can't understand it. It's too complicated. Well, actually, I suppose it depends on why you think you can't understand it. Uh, if you think it's just too, complicated, that's entirely different. It's, our brains are too small to get that round of thought. Um, if you think we can't understand it because we can never have the conceptual brains to do so, not because we're too stupid, but because there's something that takes it beyond the effable in principle, then you're in the same ballpark. So that's more like the mysterianism about philosophy of mind as opposed to maybe the final physics is just too maybe, complicated for maybe. us. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so you're thinking the Mysterians claim that it's mysterious because it's... We haven't got the conceptual. 
<laughs> not that it's too essentially complex. beyond our conceptual grasp. Not sort of just because we got our <laughs> brains are too small. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, if they run that line, yeah, that that seems to be in the same ballpark. Um, and the second question was. Um, I presume um, you're fine with there being some ineffables coming from something like personal experience. Oh, sure. And, and they're sure. ineffable precisely sure. because they may be art things that can enter the public can. So uh, I, I'm quite happy with, with the thought that there are ineffable things that you, um, which you can experience, but we just do not and cannot have the vocabulary for. Although even to say they're ineffable teeters on the brink because the notion of ineffability is a certain kind of description. But um, setting that aside, the real hard problem is when you start giving explanations of why this is so. So if you're a mysterian and just say, well, such is life, you know, you're not in the same problem. But if you say uh, these things are ineffable because they are such that um, we could not um, possibly have the categories to describe them, um, then you're teetering on the brink. It's, it's giving arguments, expressing, explaining why these things cannot be talked about. And in the process, talking about them, that's, that's the real hard problem, I think. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I was just wondering if you could comment on uh, the performative quality of your last slide. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just I wondered whether it's the ladder or whether it's Proposition Seven. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, the rest is silence and the, the image. Um, and that's a flippant way of posing the question. I suppose the better rounded way of posing it would be. And um, what do you think of the, the move towards aesthetic or ethical experience um, is, is made in philosophers such as, as, as Wittgenstein? Oh, you okay. commented on it briefly in Heidegger and his dependency on poetry. Okay. The easy question first. The last slide, I was just trying to be clever. <laughs> uh, I thought, well, there's this nice quote from Hamlet. Let me use that. And I sort of trawled through the internet to find a picture. It's kind of nice and stuck it up there. Okay. So that, but I'm afraid it wasn't very profound. Okay. Now, uh, to the question about a safety experience. Um, and let me say that my I haven't thought, I've never thought much about aesthetics. So this is a, a very uninformed thought. Okay, we have aesthetic experiences, no problem. Um, some of those, it's easy to describe. Some of these, it's not easy to describe. Um, in Japan, the discussion of aesthetic experience gets closely mixed up with Zen, which often trades on the ineffable. Um, so the little I know about Japanese aesthetics makes a lot of this. But let's stick to the West. Um, often when we describe our aesthetic experiences, we use metaphors. Okay. So we can say that the wine tastes woody or something. We can say that the music is sad. Um, you know, all, all these metaphors. Um, and they clearly are metaphors, right? Um, so when in the uh, anaphatic tradition for describing God, people describe God, some people say, well, these are just metaphors. I mean, you find something like that in Aquinas. Um, but they seem to be pushed into this. Whereas in the aesthetic debate, um, everybody knows it's a metaphor. And you might want to say, well, okay. So, okay, the thoughts are tracking something you can't describe. And so we use metaphors. Uh, and maybe that's true. Um, 
But the problem then is not so much about the first order discourse, it's about the second order discourse, about the theoretician who said, well, we have these things which we can describe, but metaphorically. Now that's not a metaphor. What would it be to describe it metaphorically? Metaphorically, I don't know. Um, so if you sort of think through the second order discourse, you do seem to hit the same problem. Um, so uh, that is the only intelligible thing I have to say about art at the very moment, okay. But it, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I should think about it some more. Thank you. I have an online question. Um, it's very interesting because a parallel discussion developed online. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll I hate just, those things. <laughs> we'll just jump to the original question and see what, what you think. Uh, Mat Matis uh, quotes it, it sounds plausible to me, but there are curious philosophical concepts that we have something like a paradox. For example, the world is everything there is, but also nothing, insofar as the world is nothing in particular. But such paradoxality seems uh, not to extend to the issue of what we can talk about. Or isn't it that we can talk about things in different ways? That is, we can talk determinately only about specific things, whereas about nothing, we can only talk indeterminately. In this way, the paradox of being able to talk about nothing and not being able to do so can go away by distinguishing senses of being able to talk about X. Yeah. All right, there's a lot there too. Um, I think to pursue that, I'd start, I'd want to start by talking about what these different ways are um, and what it is to talk about something indeterminately. I'm not sure that I have a grasp of this, but um, let's suppose that there is a distinction to be drawn here. I want to dig my heels in and say that what I've been talking about is the inevitable that something that can't be described in any way, determinately, indeterminately, metaphorically, um, uh, and uh, the reasons I've given for thinking that nothing is ineffable show that it, ain't, it just ain't characterizable in any way. Um, so, so I have a question that might have actually been answered by your answer to that last question, but um, I was wondering if you could say more about what, what exactly it means for something to be beyond the limits of thought and language, because so um, usually the people who try to uh, some of the people who try to kind of sell a theory that has an ineffable thing in it, uh, there's a sort of a manual attached to it that does two things. One of them, uh, describes precisely the sense. What, what is the sense in which that thing can be talked about? So, um, for example, for Kant, um, he's selling you that he's telling you that it is numinal because you can't apply the attributes um, to uh, uh, Monides says that, you know, you can't possibly do anything with the attributes of God, et cetera. So that's the first, uh, or the first item in, in the manual that is attached to the inevitable. Um, and the second is um, precisely why is it the case that you can't do <coughs> these things with that ineffable thing? Again, it is this is uh, Maimonides, which is false. God is the creator, we're created. Um, and I guess Bergson would say that time and uh, sorry, that thought and language is inherently spatial, but as reality is inherently temporal. Um, how would thought would be on your mind? Okay. So can I just can I just add one more? So sure. You just said something. You just said that, that you're talking about something that cannot be described in any way whatsoever. Sure. But I, I mean, there are certain ways of talking about stuff that uh, you can talk about stuff in terms of prepositions or in terms of metaphors or in terms of such experience. But there's still a sense in which there's a way of talking about things by gathering a room with somebody at four o'clock and spending two hours talking about it. And that's what you have been. Okay, so there are three things there. Right? Um, the first thing is that we had this bunch of people who all thought they were ineffable things. Um, and I think that 
what is meant by ineffable in all the cases is the same thing. And I'm going to things that cannot be characterized, described, um, spoken about. Um, so I don't think there's a disagreement between them on that. Now, the second thing is about the reasons for that. And these people certainly did have different reasons for that. So Wittgenstein's reason is not the same as Heidegger's, not the same as Kant's, okay? Um, my reason for nothingness is the one I gave you, and it's kind of simple, namely that nothing is by definition the absence of all things. And if it's the absence of all things, then everything has been removed. So there is no thing there, a fortiori, there is no thing there to predicate anything of. It's kind of a simple argument. Maybe it's fallacious, but that's what it was, right? Um, third point. Um, Yeah. So let's take your example. The thing we talked about at four o'clock on whatever it is, the um, 8th of November, 2022 in, thank you. <laughs> I'm always behind the times uh, in, in this very room. Okay. Um, now that there clearly is some sense in which you're talking about nothingness. Um, is that, the kind of thing that I'm against. No, not really. Um, because I think there's an important distinction to be drawn here between referring to something and characterizing it. So when we say nothing, this is the thing we talked about. I mean, you're, you're referring to the thing and predicating um, something of that reference, but you're not characterizing nothingness. Um, if you want to put it this way, um, it's not part of the defining conditions of nothingness or its intrinsic qualities or anything like that. Um, that's really what I had in mind. So maybe I should have been more careful um, in explaining what I meant by talking about something. So thank you for that point. I should be more careful. I am much of all the things I wanted to ask have been actually ticked off. Um, uh, so I had, I had three little things. The first, the first thing is just a tiny bit. <coughs> so when you're going through the history of um, uh, thinkers in the past of thought ineffable things, all of the examples seemed awfully lofty and mystical. And I just thought it mm. would be in your favor, in your interest, to support your presentation if you included things like Nagel's What It's Like to Be a Bat. I think um, oh. much more local, um, familiar, familiar, <laughs> familiar oh, <that's> <laughs> um, uh, and and you could also I, I, I think Slaughter Dyke talks about um, the inability to kind of understand experience in the womb. That's another interesting one, uh, which are really you know different from um, the one in the Newman. And you also said that these things were grounding things, but what it's like to be a bat is maybe not grounding of being. <laughs> mm. um, so that was the first little point. Okay, can we take this one at a time? Otherwise sure. I should forget. Okay. Um, so what it's like to be a bat, interesting example. Um, in some sense, this takes us back to the question about um, the nature of experiences and raw fields and you know the hard question, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm inclined to say the same thing about this. Uh, I agree it's not miscally anyway, uh, but I think, I, I mean, what I have to say about that is what I've already said about mysterialism. Um, but for what it's worth, um, there are other examples which I didn't talk about, uh, which are nothing whatsoever to do with um, mysticism. They're hardcore logic, okay? Uh, which I wasn't going to talk about, but since you brought up the subject, let me just mention it. Okay. So there's a paradox in set theory, sometimes called Koenig's paradox, 
Um, and it goes like this. Look, if you take transfinite numbers, um, there are lots of them. How many? Well, really, 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 really lots. So many that it's greater than any way we have of describing them. Okay, and that's sort of orthodox set theory, right? Hey, but then orth ordinals, well, transfinite numbers are well ordered. So if there are things you can't describe, there must be at least one. So what about the least ordinal you can't describe? Haven't I just described it? Oh no. Okay. So this is called Cantor's paradox, uh, Koenig's paradox. And um, you see we're in the same ballpark. I mean, because you've at least, if you want to talk about something, you've at least got to refer to it. And here's something that you can refer to and can't refer to. Um, so this is an example from logic. And you know, I'm not going to go into what set theorists make of this, but it is something that's in the same ballpark and it's got absolutely nothing to do with mysticism. Thanks. Um, yeah, and then another uh, question was piggy piggybacking off of the really interesting question that came from the back of the room um, about otherness. And it just made me think, so, so um, I think they were wondering about, um, yeah, whether or not, uh, if you like, uh, nothing is a species of otherness type thing, that kind of idea. And um, uh, yeah, and so and then you were saying perhaps, yeah, you know, in this no, no, I, I think I said it was. Yeah, yeah. It, it is a very particular case of otherness, it's true. other than beings, yeah, other yeah. than everything else, yeah, um, yeah, true. Well, well, yeah, okay, Let, let's leave it there, yeah, to speak off the cuff. Um, and then, um, so but at the same time, you were you were kind of arguing that nothingness has this, um, is, is in some sense. <coughs> So then you're almost saying that otherness is grounding, which almost sounds like saying difference is grounding, and then you're starting to sound like the list. Um, and he kind of pops his head up. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then the other thing was, was let's, just, let's, yeah, let's sure. keep them one at a time, otherwise I should forget, especially now you've mentioned Deleuze. Um, <laughs> okay, so I, I, I find it hard to understand Deleuze, all right, and I've tried. Um, but um, leave, leave Deleuze aside. Um, what I said was that nothing is other than being. It's a very special case of otherness. Now, what about otherness itself? That was the core of your question, right? Whether or not it's in Deleuze, let, let's think about the question. Um, so otherness is a relationship. It's a relationship between two things, like you and me. We're, other to each other, right? Um, so what can we make of the question of whether otherness is other? Well, it's obviously other to some things. I mean, other the relation of otherness is different from the relation of being taller than, okay? So otherness has got to be other than some things. That's true. Um, but does it play a role in grounding? I mean, if if nothing, if beings are what they are, by being other than nothing, then nothing grounds them. Does being other ground them? And that's a kind of interesting question. It's, the, uh, being other is involved in the being different from nothing, in as far as yes. Yeah. Um, look, I'm, I've never thought about that. It's an interesting question. What, what it reminds me of is a debate in the grounding literature. What's that? So, so there's this debate in the metaphysics, contemporary metaphysics literature about grounding. Mm. Okay. Um, I gave you some standard examples of grounding. But then at a certain stage, this debate um, took on a discussion of, about the, of the grounding relation itself and whether the grounding relation itself is part of what grounds the things that are grounded by other things, okay? The discussion got a bit arcane fairly fast, as you might expect. But in a sense, I think what you're asking is a species of that question, because you've got otherness, which is kind of the relationship between beings and nothing, uh, and nothing is the ground of beings, and then the relation is the, the, the otherness. And that's kind of like, is the relation between the grounded and the ground, itself part of 
the ground of the things grounded. I'm starting to sound like Deleuze now, right? <laughs> um, so, this is how it happens. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what I think about that, but my inclination at the moment is to say no. Uh, and I think I will resist that in the, in the grounding debate as well. Um, for the following reason. Um, grounding is a relation. Okay, relations are perfectly good objects. I mean, this brings us back to um, uh, Walter's question. Um, you know, properties, relations, that if, if you hear them as referred to by an noun phrase, like difference, like otherness, um, then they're objects. As such, the relation of difference, otherness, to nothing is exactly the same as the relationship between every other being, every other object, and nothing. So in, in that sense, there's nothing special about it. Uh, okay, that's my immediate reaction. Uh, but as I say, I haven't thought about it a lot, but the immediate reaction for what it's worth is that. Okay, third question. I mean, the third, the third thing with, with the original problem, the original question, um, and, and it has been addressed, I think, but, I can't, but I'm going to have to say it out loud to, to remember. Um, so it was basically, you started off talking about, um, you know, you're interested in finding uh, what's at the limits of thought. And then what's beyond the limits of thought. Beyond, yeah. beyond the limits of thought. Um, and you, you, you kind of like skirted over what we mean by thought by just kind of saying, yeah. I think that to mean some kind of description. Yeah. Um, you said description, characterization, yeah. these kind of words. Yeah. Um, so well, it immediately struck me, you know, that's a super interesting bit that we've like up another rock. Yeah. And then you then you swapped to talking about um, ineffability mm. and it's kind of answered in a question. Well, my mm. question was going to be, are you identifying um, being unable to think with being ineffable with being unable to describe? Mm. And you kind of said to the other question, yes. But I feel like there were some slights of hand there um, which are not satisfying. Okay, good. No, um... The stuff I went over very fast at the start. I don't think there are any slights of hand, but let me just be a bit clear about what I said and, and see if I can persuade you. So what we started was with the question, are there things beyond thought? Okay. And now that is a highly ambiguous question. Okay. And uh, it could mean many different things. But I wanted to specify the one that was particularly interested, that I'm particularly interested in here and now, yeah. which is thought in the sense of characterization, description, describing, you know, whatever. Um, and the virtue of that disambiguation is precisely that it ties the thing immediately to language because it talks about it in terms of conceptualization, description, characterization. Um, so, um, that's the way I got to ineffability, because the ineffable is what you can't describe, characterize, um, conceptualize. Yeah, so I just feel like that's not being thought justice. Um, that was the thing that's kind of stunk there for me in that move. Um, Say it again. That you're not doing thought justice. That, that you're kind of oh you're look, making it to um, be a very impoverished thing. In it. Maybe, maybe that's true. Look, I mean, I, I as I say, you may be many things by thinking about. Now, in some sense, part of this has come up in the discussion already. Um, uh, we've talked about um, knowledge by acquaintance and knowledge by description, right? And certainly if you are acquainted with something, whether it's ultimate reality or the taste of a peach or your own consciousness or you know, any of these things, um, there's certainly a sense in which you seem to be thinking by a thinking by acquaintance. Okay? Sure, yeah. I don't want to deny that such a thing is thinking. Obviously it's thinking, it's, it has a part of our cerebral mechanism as it were. Um, and there may well be other things which you could mean by that question. There probably are in fact. Uh, philosophical claims are often in many ways ambiguous. Um, but I just wanted to focus in on that particular claim 
Yeah, because no, that's what I wanted to I'm talk about. A cheap shot there, to be honest. Like you... No, that's, that's fair enough. I mean, it's fair enough to point out that the question could be many things. And I'm sure there are um, interesting things one might want to say about unbroken. Like, you know, what it is to be a bat, for example, it's, it's already come up. Um, but uh, if, if you don't try and sort of get the question you do want to deal with clear at the start, um, you're going to get a bit confused. So, I mean, actually, I've alluded to this already. If you look at the discussions of nothing, both contemporary discussions and discussions in the history of philosophy, philosophy you will see people slide, blind, slide blindly between nothing, the noun, and nothing, the quantifier, okay? And start making claims about one when they're talking about the other, thinking they're talking about the same thing. So that, that's why I was at pains to start with this disambiguation, so that um, I didn't slide, slide blindly, slide blindly between these two things. So, you know, getting your topic straight is really important. Otherwise, you can go down this garden of forking paths, which you didn't mean to go down. That's sometimes quite fun to go down. <laughs> True. And, um, you know, people like me make a living out of it. <laughs> minutes and three more questions. Yep. So, <laughs> good luck. Yeah. Um, so it's a continuation of Sonia's otherness question, but yes. maybe a bit more pointed. Yep. I think your last, uh, your, your, your argument um, being an object was uh, if X uh, had been the same as nothing and so on, I'm going to swap out instead of nothing, I'm going to say any other Y, right? So any non-identical Y. X and plug it in, and I think you're going to get dependence absolutely. Yeah, everywhere. that's true. Um, things depend on being what they are because they uh, are, are different from other things. I mean, that, that, that's a sort of standard Buddhist thought. Right. Okay. Um, but I wasn't, I was talking about what it is to be an object. I get that you would, you're operating on a more abstract level, but we did talk about object X in there. So I thought if we can put object Y in, we can get the result that you denied earlier, which no, was that it's, the it's, three it's, No, on it's not swapping X or Y. It's swapping the predicate object for something else. Okay, but does that mean that the tree does depend on the shadow after all? No. I mean, it may do, but for completely different reasons. Okay, which I'm not going to go into because it's set with Y-N Buddhism. Okay, but the point is that what I argued about was what grounds something being an object. That's the otherness that I had in mind, okay? Now, if you can talk about what makes someone a banker or a fascist or whatever, uh, then you can, it's gonna be, the, the, the otherness is gonna to relate to completely different things. I, I agree with that. So it, it's only, the otherness involved in being an object that I wanted to talk about. Uh, yeah, uh, I think I'm asking something similar to Neil here a little bit. Um, I, I do usually do social epistemology, so it's a bit scary for me. But, um, uh, so if nothing grounds kind of reality and language and stuff like that, then you have your negative dependence thing. You say the reason for this grounding is because um, language is negatively or not language, or an object, objects are negatively dependent on not being nothing, right? But isn't nothing dependent on not being something? Yeah. So doesn't that mean that <laughs> surely then reality is grounded on nothing, but nothing's grounded on reality or something like that? Because the, the, so you can just reverse the direction of yeah, the negative dependence, right? Okay, interesting question. Um, we're, we're teaching on the brink of a further paradox here because nothing this is not an object, uh, but nothing this is an object. So it also depends on nothing, even though it doesn't. That's not quite your question, but it's just warning that we're in paradoxical territory here. It is and is not an object. Therefore, all objects, all and only objects depend on nothing. So nothing does and does not depend on 
it's all. Uh, I think I, I, I'd endorse that. Okay, that wasn't quite your question, which is slightly more interesting. Um, does nothing depend on something? It depends on not being something. Well, okay, look. Okay. Um, the word something is a quantifier. Okay, now, everything and nothing can be quantifiers or they can be noun phrases. But as I've thought about this, and as far as I can see, the word something can only be a quantifier. I can't think of any examples where it's a noun phrase. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that. I mean, if people can come up with examples, that'd be really interesting. Yeah. But if that's right, when you say that nothing depends on not being something, okay, maybe there's a scope distinction there. But one natural way to hear it is that um, there is something such that being nothing depends on not being it. That's a treat as a quantifier, right? Let me say that again. Nothing depends on not being something. Well, one way of hearing that is something is such that being nothing depends on being different from it. And I guess that's true. Um, although we're in paradoxical territory, it depends on it being different from itself. So therefore it depends on being different from something. Okay. So I, the, your question is a very interesting one, but it raises this very sensitive question of whether the word something can be a substantive as well as a quantifier. And that, I think that's what your argument, I mean, I think the answer to your question turns on the answer to that being no. Um, but as I say, if you can think of examples where the word something is used as a, a noun phrase and not a quantifier, that would be very interesting. Like something is happening tomorrow. Like, I don't know if it's not quantifier. Oh, quantifi there is an X, such X is happening tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, sorry. No, the distinction of the, 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 the realm we're talking about. So something is in the realm, the language of science in the imminent. Would the nothing, the depend, what nothing would depend on would be within the immeasurable? The, uh, if I understand the point, you're just emphasizing the fact that Something is a quantifier there? Yeah, yeah. but I'm, I'm trying oh. to rephrase it within that framework. Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> okay. No, there was another question, I think. We, 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 yeah, but that one question. We, we, we've got time for it. But let me just say that, um, you know, when, when you rephrase the question like that, um, something is such that nothing depends on what it is on it. Yeah, sure, it depends on being different from itself. Um, so that's a straightforward answer, okay? Um, it's going to get tangled, if but only if you think that the word something can be a noun phrase well, as your example yeah. showed. No, 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 in Kant you have the transcendental object, is that, and it's just something. Something is X, is that a quantifier? Uh, okay, good. Uh, something. Yeah, and he says it's. What he speaks about it isn't clear, and it's not clear. Yeah, no. yeah. Because it's way in English. Like but, the translation is also problematic. Yeah, but it goes. Oh. Yeah, but think what something. the rest of the quote says. He says something x. Yeah. So there is an x such that it yeah. is it. Okay, it's a quantifier. Yeah. 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 A question quickly. Yeah, go ahead. So I thought it was about everything rather than something. <laughs> <laughs> Some thoughts, because I mean, during your talk, this stuff came to my mind about, about a more well trodden paradoxical path with the absolute generality and so on. So, um, one thought is that that might be another route to nothing as, as the kind of complement of everything. Um, and another, another question, more generally, is 
to what extent do you think there are parallels there? I mean, is, is it all yeah. the same thing or is it something quite different? I mean, can, no. can you predicate things? We're in the same ballpark here, Adam. We're in what? We're in the same ballpark right. here. Right, okay, yeah. Okay, in fact, earlier this year, um, a book of mine came out called Everything and Nothing. And it was a debate with a German philosopher, Marcus Gabriel. Um, and I think that, that, that nothing substantive, nothing the substantive, and everything the substantive are both perfectly legitimate objects. And Marcus has made himself sort of famous or maybe infamous in Germany because he thinks that the, uh, the world, everything, the totality of things does not exist. Um, and he was a bit, not, he was not so sure about nothing, but he was skeptical. <laughs> Okay, but so we're certainly in the same ballpark here. Okay, um, so these are contentious questions. So, I mean, my preferred characterization of nothing is not quite the one I gave in the talk. Uh, my preferred characterization of nothing is the neurological sum of the things in the empty set. Okay, um, so. If we talk about the other end, not the bottom, but the top, everything, um, if you give that definition, you're going to run into this question of whether you can quantify them of all things. But let's avoid that by saying nothing is the meriological sum of things which are self-identical. Now, that, that's a perfectly good object in standard meriology. That's not to say that standard meriology is right, but um, it, I kind of I like that definition so I would give that definition of everything. <laughs> Wonderful final words. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank the audience here and thank the audience online. Um, thank you for participating. We're now going down to the DCA to have some drinks. Everybody's welcome. Just join us. And yeah, I hope to see you all down there. Uh, yeah, just one.